The following video is three weeks worth of victories and failures. In proper hover bike fashion, we'll be throwing random modifications at a bike just to see what happens. A quick recap of what's going on, our last video with this bike showed some failure in a long distance endurance ride. The motor had suffered several soft seizures and there was significant piston damage along the way. I then decided to take my limited knowledge and experience to attempt some simple modifications that might alleviate this problem. A secondary issue that had plagued this bike for months was an unstable idle. This issue had me chasing my tail for quite some time. I was finally able to discover the cause and eliminate the issue. Standard disclaimer which pops up in about half of my videos, I am not an expert at any of this. When it comes to Minarelli hybrids, I'm the first to admit I'm in over my head. I'm simply showing you the results of trial and error. For my fellow new builders or individuals who are considering getting into the motorized bike hobby, I would like to point out that a lot of the issues we're dealing with in this video are specific to this custom hybrid motor and not something you're really going to have to deal with on your standard China doll motors. Those would be the kits that come in around $100 to $120. So for you guys, most of this is just going to be entertainment, but there could be some useful information. To help save some time in this video, I'll leave a link to the last video in the description so you can catch up on exactly what's going on. Starting with the piston, as expected, we saw significant scoring and gouging. It was pretty obvious right away that this piston needed to be replaced, so I went to GY6 Racing and ordered a couple extra. While waiting for their arrival, I wanted to see if it was practical or at the very least possible to save a piston, so we got to work. I take no credit for the modifications that we're about to try and want to give a big shout out to everybody who left these ideas in the comment section of our last video. And you guys really must want to see this engine succeed because I received the most amount of suggestions in that video than I ever have. Before digging into the piston, I wanted to try a suggestion from Build Break Fix. He had the idea of running a stock China doll piston in the hybrid motors. Although the two of us approach the hobby in different ways and don't exactly get along, I'll never deny a creative idea. I like this idea for several reasons. One, I've got a bunch of them, and you might as well, and the two reasons that he states are, first, it's a thicker piston which should have a slower thermal expansion rate, causing less soft seizures, and two, because this piston is already designed to work with the crank in the motor, it'll be easier to balance and possibly not even necessary to do it all. So these sounded great on paper, but how about in practice? Let's take a look at the piston and how it matches up to the cylinder. At first it looked like it was going to work and it even passed the piston drop test, them both being 47mm pistons. But unfortunately in my collection I wasn't able to find one to match up to the Minarelli cylinder. He may have a unique piston that I don't know about, 
but I found the low hole piston to be the best option. The high hole was just too short and it would require a smaller spacer but could still work if you have the ability to make your own spacers. Uh, but both of them use the same ringing gaps. And when I matched it up to the Minarelli, the ringing gaps of the China Doll piston interfere with the transfer ports. This would almost certainly cause a ring snag. It's possible I missed something. He may have relocated the ring in gaps by filling the original pinholes and drilling new ones. I'm not sure if that's a thing, but it's definitely something that could be tried. So I'm not saying it won't work or you can't get lucky, but this just looks too sketchy for me, so I'm going to pass on this option. However, if any of you guys are testing this with some success, let me know in the comments. If you have any videos, I'll try to give you a shout out. Back to the stock Minarelli piston, and first I wanted to clean it up. The goal here was to remove the absolute bare minimum amount of material. I have no idea where the line is between adequate piston clearance and piston slap, but it's probably a fine line. Using a Scotch-Brite pad and some very fine grit sandpaper, I applied even pressure throughout the entire piston to help smooth out the gouging. Some of these trenches were too deep to really do anything about, so we work with what we had. While we were cleaning the piston, we took one of the suggestions from our last video and we beveled the piston skirt in such a way that it would promote oil to get between the piston and the cylinder during the downstroke. Like many of the other mods we'll be trying, this is of course just in theory. Mostly a shot in the dark for me personally, but it makes sense and I don't see how it could hurt anything. Fortunately, these aluminum pistons are really easy to modify, so this took no time at all. Next, I wanted to try something a little more curious that I saw in a Facebook group. There was some talk about adding lubrication holes to the piston between the transfer exhaust port and transfer intake port. They wouldn't interfere with the ports, so shouldn't cause any issues, but they would allow lubrication from the underside of the piston to make its way to the wall and help in these trouble areas where the gouging is severe. Finding information about this technique is incredibly limited, so this is obviously experimental for me. However, I have seen this technique used on cylinders with exhaust bridges. There'll be some small holes in the piston next to the exhaust bridge to help keep it cool. I don't have an exact reason for the size of hole I used or its specific location. I just tried to target the trouble area using a small drill bit. Once I was done, I cleaned it up and made sure there were no burrs, and we were pretty much good to go. I should point out that the information I've found about pistons that these have been done on are forged pistons. These cast pistons are not recommended, so if you try it, do it at your own risk. At this point, I probably would have been good just to put the piston back into the cylinder as is and run the bike. I'm actually fairly confident that these modifications would have solved, or at the very least, greatly alleviated most of our issues. However, a lot of the suggestions in our last video said that the cylinder simply needed to be honed, and that I probably could have omitted these other modifications by simply honing the cylinder by itself. Although I regret not testing the piston modifications before honing the cylinder, they will still get a chance to see if they make a difference, as I have a new cylinder on the way and a new piston. I'm simply going to modify the piston and then run the bike and see how it does. But in this situation, I decided to go ahead and get a flex hone. My time is limited and under short notice, I was unable to find a flex hone specifically for 47 millimeter cylinders. However, on Amazon, I found this one, which claims it'll do 46 to 48 millimeters. I don't know if that's an oversight, but I used it anyways. Best I can tell, honing a cylinder with one of these is very simple, and I was able to do it without making any critical mistakes, except for one, and this is where my major failure comes into play. I had never used one of these before, and the majority of videos I watched about how to use them were on four-stroke motors. Tutorials on four-strokes are simple because they don't have ports, and they don't have to emphasize just how important it is to make sure you get every last bit of this honing compound out of the cylinder. Through a combination of ignorance and laziness, I didn't thoroughly clean the transfers or intake adapters, and this cost me severely. You see, this honing compound is kind of like a sandy clay. It sticks to everything and is, well, rather difficult to get out if you've never done it before. 
Naturally, I assumed parts cleaner would do the trick. I later found out that this specific honing compound is impervious to brake cleaner or carb cleaner. Turns out, you need to use hot soapy water. So these all being several factors that caused the catastrophic failure you're about to see, let's go ahead and run the bike anyways and see how it did. I've had a couple of people ask, you know, how these uh, solder beads hold up. Uh, I use them on pretty much all my builds because I'm always shortening the cables. I've never had one of these break off or strip through the uh, throttle piston uh, for what it's worth. But, you know, when I put these on, I make sure this clay cable is very clean. It's degreased and I use solder flux. And doing that, uh, I've never had one of these come off on me. my discord members uh, tan he got a set of Gemini's he said he, he did not use thread lock originally on the sprocket bolts and he said after a while he found that the bolts had backed out <clears throat> against the rotor so good thing he caught that but um, yeah make sure you guys use thread lock on these that was the first thing I checked when I got off the bike after hearing about his story and oh well, mine looked like they haven't budged uh, but I used thread lock on those. I just used blue. Uh, medium strength would probably be a better idea, like the orange stuff. It's still removable, but it's like three times stronger. The bike actually felt good and ran pretty smooth, but it was lacking in power and would never touch the pipe. After returning home and checking the motor, I noticed that the compression was all but non-existent. I could pretty much turn over the motor with two fingers on the magnet side. And that's a big red flag. It was when I noticed this dark gray flaky material seeping out of the exhaust port that I put two and two together and realized I screwed up. Don't get me wrong, it's not like I just gave the cylinder a quick wipe and put it back on the bike. I did go to town with a scrub brush and soapy water after the parts cleaner proved to be ineffective. But I definitely could have gotten more enthusiastic in the transfer ports and underneath the intake adapter with Q-tips, which I just didn't think about. After removing the cylinder, we went ahead and examined everything, and yep, yeah, it was pretty much working as its own cylinder hone while I was riding the bike. Needless to say, that is just terrible. 
It pretty much just ate away at everything important on the top end. The piston became smaller, the rings got thinner, and the cylinder got wider. The ring gap got so wide that you can actually see excessive blow-by on the piston itself. We had taken the bike on about 20 miles worth of riding while this damage was occurring, and for what it's worth, we saw no signs of soft seizure on the piston. It actually looked pretty good, but unfortunately, our modifications really never got to be tested due to the fact that the piston cylinder clearance became so extreme, I don't think it would have mattered anyways. Not knowing how severe the damage to the cylinder was as far as bore diameter is concerned, I went ahead and rehoned it very lightly, just enough to get the cross hatching back. I then very thoroughly re-cleaned the cylinder, ensuring that I got every square millimeter of the transfer and intake ports. Knowing that some of this polishing compound certainly got into the case, I removed it from the bike, took it outside next to a running water hose, and rinsed out the case with gasoline about a dozen times, until I could only see fresh blue gas mix coming out of the case. At this point, I was just waiting for the spare pistons to arrive in the mail, so I decided to kill some time by trying to once again find this elusive idle issue that I've been having for months. Ever since this problem arose way back in our performance and port work series, I had closely been examining the case and the intake system, ensuring that I had absolutely no air leaks. I had watched countless tutorials on tuning multiple different carburetors, taken suggestions from the comment section and my Discord community, and still was unable to find the problem. As a matter of fact, it didn't matter what top end I had on the motor, what reed valve I used, or what carburetor, it was the exact same issue. And this had started to lead me to believe that maybe the bottom end was just defective and there was a crack in the case somewhere that I simply couldn't find. Ironically enough, the aha moment came to me last week while I was riding the electric fat bike down the trail. I had some time to kill and in my head I was trying another process of elimination. I got what now seems like the obvious idea to go back through my old footage and try and find out what other things I added to the bike at the exact time this issue arose. And thanks to the catalog of back footage, that's when I found it. The BBR tuning ignition system was the only other thing I added to the bike at the exact same time I added the reed valve. So we pulled the Power Storm performance system from DLH off of our Phantom 85 and swapped it out onto the hybrid. And just like that, the idle popped right into place and has been perfect ever since. It's rather embarrassing to admit defeat to a Bikeberry product, but I'm not claiming it's a bad ignition system. Throttle response and power always felt good, and it always looked like I had a strong spark with this system. My best guess is that the Bikeberry ignition system has a pre-retarded ignition curve, which might be good in a lot of situations, but you may need to play with the magnet to get a good idle. As I actually found, retarding the timing, which was one of the suggestions from our last video, made the idle much, much worse. So just a heads up, if you're running the Bikeberry ignition system and you're having idle issues, try playing with your magnet's timing, maybe go a little more advanced, or if you can't fix the issue, swap it back out for a stock CDI and see if that fixes the issue. For anyone who actually has the capability to test the ignition curve on the Bikeberry ignition system, I would love to see if you feel it's an improvement over the stock one, because I would hate to throw it under the bus without knowing. Having assumed for so long that the idle issue had something to do with the G2 Reed system, and admittedly not being a huge fan of it due to its complexity compared to other options, it was unjustified to assume that this idle issue was the G2 Reed, which is why we haven't given up on it. I was certain to find the issue before making any claims. On that note, there are a lot of things on these bikes that get a bad rap simply due to other issues. So always ensure that you've tested as many possibilities as you can before replacing parts that you assume are junk. That is a really good sign, baby. <laughs> I fixed it. Finally found it. The damn CDI.
<laughs> ah, fire ants. Ah, fire ants. <laughs> We can go ahead and backtrack a little bit. I didn't want to mix up the video sections, but while we were testing the new CDI, the pistons from GY6 Racing arrived in the mail. And that is actually what you saw the bike using during the idle test. A quick examination of these pistons, they're not identical to the one that came with my kit. The windows are in a slightly higher position, and the top of the piston, or the crown, is a bit rough. I debated on whether or not I should polish this, but for now, we're just going to run it. And here's why. Once I inserted the new rings, it turns out that our ring gap is 0.03 inches, which, from what I understand, is excessively large. That's something you would expect to see in an engine with a lot of wear. Luckily, these motors use dual rings, so I think I can get away with using this, as we'll find out shortly. But without a doubt, our compression is not going to be great. After repeating the drop test with the new piston, yeah, it's not looking great. She almost just falls straight through the cylinder. At this point, I had options. I could have purchased one of those aluminum cylinders, I believe they're called the Athenas, but I refuse to let my mistakes give anybody's brand a bad name, so we're going to try a fresh DLH cylinder. This was not his equipment's fault. This was 100% mine. However, if the piston modifications with the fresh cylinder still produce soft seizures, I will be moving on to one of the aluminum jugs. If I did enough digging, I could probably find a slightly overboard piston and the proper rings to continue to run the cylinder. The cylinder would probably need to be re-rounded or re-bored by a professional just to make sure that it is round and not oval or waffled. But that's just not worth my time. So we're just going to put the fresh piston ring in it, give it a 20 minute warm up and break in cycle, and then we're going to send it. And let's find out how that turned out. Obviously with new ring, own cylinder, doing that's not a great idea. But since we're getting a new cylinder, new piston anyways, um, I'm not too worried about it. Clutch is rubbing again. My never ending battle with the super clutch. <laughs> I have some good ideas that we're gonna try that I actually think will work. Just one thing at a time, you know? At least it doesn't slip, <laughs> that's for sure. sprocket with 26 inch wheels. Motor sprocket's a 10 tooth.
it's down in power, yeah, it barely touches the pipe, but it gets up there alright. At the very least, you can see how usable these cylinders are after you've, you know, done something stupid. Anyways, after we got home and examined the bike, it looks like I blew out one of the gaskets on the reed valve. And this is because the bolts were bottoming out, and it wasn't making a perfect seal, so I added an extra washer. I felt like it might have been running a little rich in the top end, but what do I know with all these issues the bike's having, so I downjetted from the 100 main to the 95. I didn't see any improvement. As a matter of fact, I actually lost a little bit of power. I don't know if that's simply due to the bike just not agreeing with that riding style right off the rip, or if it was just right as is. So I'll probably go back to the 100, especially with the new cylinder, as I want to treat it right. Anyways, top speed is not what I'm after, it's usually never what I'm after. I want to know how long these motors can go on an endurance ride at a relatively high speed, which is what I'll be testing with the new cylinder once again, but with the piston modifications this time, so they'll get a proper test. So this is where the bike's sitting at the moment, we're just waiting for the new cylinder, and once it shows up, we're going to try again. I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.